Good morning, afternoon, and evening, traders. This is Paul Robinson here at Daily FX. We're going to go through today's session of Daily FX Roundtable. I've got with me my colleagues David Song and Tyler Yell. Hello, guys. How are you doing? Hello, Paul. Good to be with you all. How's it going, guys? Good, good, good. Hey, how's it going? Uh, so we're going to talk today a little bit about uh, we're going to talk about some UK uh, data and whatnot and what's been going on with the pound. We're going to talk about some trade ideas. We're going to get some new insights. This is the third session for those of you uh, who haven't been with us so far. This is the third session of the roundtable. We do this every other week. Uh, Tyler Yell will be this will be his first one, so welcome aboard. Uh, and he'll give us his, his inner market analysis and give us a different viewpoint on than than say myself or David and and uh, you guys feel free to to post questions in the question box. We'll try to get to them uh, as we can and hopefully everybody finds this an enjoyable and educational experience. So David, how's it going? Doing well, Paul. David. Doing well. All right, all right. So you were uh, you were talking about earlier before we got on the mic. We were talking about uh, UK data, mm -hmm. and we were talking about this week and how it wasn't uh, it was all generally bearish. Uh, Relatively, I mean, and, and, uh, we had you know ahead. jobless claims, headline jobless claims, probably the only one that came in better than expected. Uh, CPI weaker than expected. Even again, as you mentioned, retail sales. Uh, weaker than expected and you know we are seeing cable a bit under pressure here but you know I think there's a bigger thing we need to watch Paul which is of course the uh, the deadline for this UK referendum EU referendum uh, we'll see how this whole process will turn out here but you know right now I think and, and this goes along you know with what I think um, I was talking about my webinar and uh, really the discussion that we're having amongst the crowd and you know let me take over the screen real quickly here um, but Go ahead. I do see a lot of disconnect in the market, and I'm sure some of you guys here may share my sentiment. Um, and for now, this is probably the one of the bigger discussion I've been having with the guys on the desk. Is you know, you look at some of these currency, uh, especially the majors, uh, they look very nice right now. And you know, Chris here. Uh, from the audience saying good morning and also dollar cat is wedging so you know I know what you're talking about Chris we're seeing some of these ranges these um, divergences are even starting to materialize across some of the different uh, pairs right now so for cable you know I've been talking about this sort of late uh, 2016 range if you will of course that big range that we got on the day of that British pound flash crash so I've been watching this sort of sideways chop in sterling uh, my personal game plan I'm not going to touch any sterling crosses until you know we get through this whole referendum but you know Paul we've been sort of going back and forth about you know what does this mean we got a lot of uh, data this weekend you know Tyler you even talking about you know weren't we supposed to be getting a little bit more volatility a little bit more clarity in terms of you know what's going to happen with the US dollar and uh, personally I'll bring this up and let me shift our focus to maybe some of the price action. I think the euro looked very interesting this week. And, and I just want to clear this up before I move on. And, you know, Paul and Tyler, you know, we talk about these technical patterns and, you know, what ifs, you know, what if this, what if that starts to pan out. But, you know, I'm starting to look at this as, you know, is this really sort of a bottoming process on the euro, right? When I look at it the fun like it, right? Uh, yeah. And then when I look at the fundamentals, we had very dovish rhetoric out of the ECB. We got their policy meeting minutes this week. They continue to portray a very dovish outlook for monetary policy. You know, one of the themes I'll watch is whether or not, you know, they'll try to increase their efforts to ward off a taper tantrum, right? But right now, you know, left shoulder, we're holding above that 105 handle. So as long as we hold above that region, I do see the risk that maybe this could turn to inverse head and shoulders. Maybe we could stretch yeah, all the exactly. way back and test trendline resistance here. But, you know, what's your guys sort of take on this? And I know Tyler was even talking about, you know, how maybe commodities are telling us one thing right now. And, you know, I'm even looking across the benchmark equity indices, some of these mm -hmm. general themes and dynamics I, that I've been following. And you know, I am seeing a lot of disconnect here. You guys, uh, you guys seen the movie Gladiator? Of course, <laughs> of course about Russell 50 Rome. times. <laughs> I think, yeah, maybe at least, right? Are you not entertained? I think that's what the dollar is saying right now. Because you come in with this week's data, CPI above expectations, yelling a bit more hawkish, um, and and I, and I just kind of feel like the fact that the dollar isn't isn't rallying on this says that you know the markets are not entertained. Though the market's given it everything basically that we we would have thought it wanted. I mean, you've got 
Fed basically at both mandates, full employment. That was kind of the, uh, you know, the, the echo of Humphrey Hawkins this week, you know, full employment, mm -hmm. um, you know, less slack in the market. Um, it's, yeah, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab the screen. If you guys don't mind tossing me the screen here. Yeah, I'm going to uh, throw it to you right now. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. And, and so, you know, we have, we have this environment, and when you look at, when you look at kind of this, this longer-term view of DXY, which I've got a, I've got a long-term pitchfork thrown on it. I'm going to just zoom in here. You can see we're, we're still holding above the support, and I actually had an article out, um, I think it was last week, saying you should watch this DXY bounce because we came off the daily Ichimoku cloud. Uh, we came off of uh, this pitchfork channel, which for those of you that are uncomfortable with pitchforks, it makes sense. You know, A lot of people have different ways of drawing it. I like to draw mine with the handle off the momentum close low. So whenever you get like an extreme RSI reading, uh, that's what I take the handle off of. You can see that over here and then draw some pivots. And, and it's frame price action. Well, all that being said, it, in my view, we kind of have an environment that should have given a dollar a boost. And, and even when Yellen was speaking and we saw uh, we saw Yellen speaking, and you know, two years, two year yields went higher, and ten years hit, I think, two five two. We saw the dollar hit up high, but then we got this little shooting star that I've highlighted right here. All that being said, I think if we break down right now, you know, that if if we break down, it's a big if, but if we break down, you can see we're basically moving away from this entire bullish structure that we've been in. Um, and, it, and it just seems like we have an environment, not to get too political, but the markets are saying, okay, Trump, what are you going to do? <laughs> like, we've heard the words, what are you going to do? Um, and, and he's been active. I mean, he's been incredibly active. But it still seems like, you know, and, and at least from my view, and, you know, Paul mentioned earlier and about the intermarket analysis approach that I take, which for those of you guys uh, that are uncomfortable or un unfamiliar with that, it's basically the viewpoint that the market is likely the best economist there is, that, that the market is a discounting mechanism, uh, it's going to interpret impact of economic news, uh, and, and while it doesn't always make the right choice or the right, you know, the, the right prediction, it's a lot more accurate, at least in my experience, than, than most people. And so all that being said, you look at you look at the world that we're in right now. I think if basically the dollar continues to pull away, which it means pulling off its its bullish structure, which seems to correlate with what we're seeing in the yields, and I can touch on that later. It, it seems like we have this environment where that could absolutely bring into the view what David was just talking about with a higher euro um, and higher commodity currencies as well. So those are some of the kind of the bigger views that I'm looking at right now, guys. Can I yeah, can I let me let me uh, just pick your brain here for a second because sure. I'm, uh, Ichimoku is not a discipline that that I personally implement, but I I do know that many many do. Uh, what is it right now with the with the U.S. dollar in terms of how how the cloud is positioned? I guess if you will, I'm, I might I'm probably using the wrong terminology. But yeah. What is what is it saying? What yeah, is is it, is it is it is it neutral? Is it turning bearish? Is it is it you know? Yeah, so, so right now what it's showing, the fact that we're kind of in the cloud after being above the cloud means that we're either in a deep correction or starting a downtrend. It's, it's quite mm -hmm. simply too early to tell right now. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that I love about Ichimoku, uh, which, which kind of seems uh, prehistoric from a technical trader's point of view, is this lagging line here, which is just the current price pushed back 26 periods. If it's mm -hmm. below price from 26 periods ago, which it is right now on the DXY, in fact, let me take off the, the pitchfork to try and... Uh, clear clear this up a bit. Um, if the lagging line is below current or price from 26 periods ago, it means that we're we're in a correction or there is some type of a bearish momentum. If we find an environment where price breaks below the cloud and momentum mm -hmm. is below price from 26 periods ago, to me. If you buy that environment, you're standing on the tracks when the train's coming through because you've got mm -hmm. full bearish pressure pushing against you and and. None of us, especially in a market as large as FX, has the ability to, you know, to, to fight that with any with any credibility. So, uh, right now, it's basically showing either a deep correction or what could be, but we don't really have the evidence, if you will, technically speaking, uh, what could be the start of of a pretty aggressive move lower. Right, right, and you know what? To that, I'm gonna I'm actually gonna take over here for a second, please. And uh, the reason why you know I was asking with with regards to the Ichimoku is because if it is in fact starting to indicate that we're turning lower, uh, you know, and, and David even touched on this a little bit, uh, we've got this, this is the Euro, but we'll, so we'll go back and back it up to the, the DXY. Uh, from, from my view, right, we, we, we've got a head and shoulders forming, right, so that would, you know, so with, your, with the cloud turning lower, 
right, with the momentum starting to turn lower, and, and, and as you said, if it starts to drop a little bit more, then, you know, you're starting to get into the danger zone, and of course, that would then likely co coincide with, with, with a move towards the neckline, right? But one of the, one of the you know, you were talking about this shooting star that happened. I, I thought that, that where it occurred was, was a textbook spot because, yeah. you know, looking at this lower trend line here, right, and then you put the parallel to it, you know, you've got a lot of inflection points that go all the way back to, to spring of last year, right? So, so we've got those inflection points coming all the way through, and then, and then the other day, you know, the dollar looked like it was ready to take off, and, and everybody got excited, and whoop, you know, they took the rug out from underneath everybody and, and, and reversed it. So to me, right now, is what we've got is we've got a right shoulder forming, uh, and then you know, eventually, of course, in order to confirm a, uh, a, a top here, a head and shoulders top, you've got to break the neckline. Uh, which would quickly bring this lower right. trend line in place, and then you know a lot of people don't trade the DXY, right? So, right. so as, as we're talking about the dollar it, here, I just wanna I just wanna mm -hmm. butt in real quick and just just want to throw this Go out ahead. to you guys because this is I think you know a broad discussion we're having at the desk, um, and I want to just see what your guys are take on this, but. If you guys are watching yields, and I know Tyler, you watch those, you know, two, ten, thirty years very closely, and I think right. this is where markets are bringing, market participants are bringing up this idea that is the Fed going to be forced maybe to raise rates sooner rather than later? I think the broader trajectory for U.S. yields is on a higher trajectory, so that is one thing that we can fight. And you know, if you look at Fed fun, uh, Fed funds right now. Uh, still pr uh, pricing just about an 80% probability that we'll see the Fed hold in uh, the next quarter meeting in March. And that's my sort of argument, you know, and, and Tyler, I, I love that parallel, um, the pitchfork that you had very clean. And, you know, Paul, that's where I'm starting to watch, you know, the euro dollar and what's happening with that, the dollar index. And, you know, is the dollar in for a larger correction? And that's where, you know, let, let's bring the discussion here. And I know we've been watching some of these emerging market currencies as well. And that's where I think, is that also telling us something there where my personal favorite dollar peso and um, let me bring up the charts here about what I'm watching personally for the dollar peso and uh, let me, maybe I'm, let me pass this on over to you yes and maybe I'm jumping the gun here this is actually one of the trades or a setup that I'm watching going into the week ahead guys and the fact that we're catching nice support here um, holding above those December lows, I think it looks very constructive and uh, could maybe turn out to be a head and shoulders down the road here. But, you know, I am pretty encouraged the fact that we're seeing that RSI turn around. We're seeing it try to break out of this near-term bearish formation right now. So some nice convincing moves that I think we are going to see support hold for the dollar peso. But, you know, what's happening with the dollar rand? And I know, Paul, you've been sort of all over this theme about the break in the dollar rand. And we're trying to get a move back above former support. And let me show you guys how far back really the support zone goes right? from all the way back I would argue since 2015 so we're breaching these levels from all the way back in 2015 what does this mean I think the broader bias right uh, very telling that we may see some further declines here but you know even with the EM currencies I think we're seeing a very mixed picture and uh, even more so let's bring it back to some of the dollar pairs I guess I'm already jumping the gun with some of the pairs I'm watching, but you know I always like to do this overlay with what's happening with uh, dollar yen and uh, the Nikkei 225. And for now, I think my personal sort of game plan is it looks as though a lot of these uh, key dynamics relationships that we're used to seeing, yes, yeah, some of them are playing out, some of them not so much. And I think we got to be very mindful of you know looking at some of the pairs that are that are more technically clean. There are you know pairs that I like watching, like Aussie yen. Uh, a little bit more favorable to me than the dollar yen personally. I think the levels are much more cleaner. We broke the fresh highs for the Aussie yen, so that one I'm still a little bit more constructive. But you know, personally with the dollar yen, and maybe this is what it's really trying to tell us with with um, not only the dollar, but maybe even with the risk appetite that you know we're getting this sort of consolidation uh, in the benchmark equity indices. Maybe the U.S. bucked the trend this week. We saw those record highs. I'm sure you guys were watching that move. Um, but what does this tell us? And you know, that's the that's the sort of theme I want to. I guess throw out to you guys, we only have one more full week of February left. And, you know, once we head into March, there's going to be a lot of themes to watch, right? The Fed's quarterly rate decision, you know, will they hike, will they not? And we'll have to watch yields, I think, very closely and see what the markets are telling us. But even beyond that, what's going to happen with this whole UK referendum? So, you know, I think there's a bit of caution going out personally. And, you know what, let's bring back... I know Tyler, you like this one. Well, you know, you you well, just just <laughs> while you while you had the dollar yen Nikkei uh, yes. overlay up there, you know, what's interesting is see, I is to me, the Nikkei is going through a consolidation phase to move higher, 
but then it looks a little less that looks a little less convincing uh, from a, from a dollar yen perspective, right? So dollar yen looks like maybe you could, mm -hmm. you could you could head lower here, maybe make a new low. Uh, obviously, if we get some broad dollar selling, which would be you know, that 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 bigger picture DXY pattern that we were looking at. Although you have to put that into perspective too, the DXY because 58% of that thing is the euro. Right, so right. so that's that's one yeah. thing that you, you kind of always got to think about uh, is that it is it is dominated by uh, you know it's dominated by by one one currency for the most part, right? You know what I can't help but think of with dollar yen is just you know quite simply the again this is kind of a, an intermarket view on it, but you've got VIX. If you look at like the daily sentiment index on the VIX, the five day moving average is nine nine percent bulls. Uh, the, the the CBOE volatility index guys just hit to a 19-month low, and naturally you've got equities, as as you guys were just alluding to, at least in the U.S., as high as they are. That seems like a recipe for instability, for high volatility, mm -hmm. where you have such an elevated market, uh, you know, for for multiple reasons, but such an elevated market. One 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 component or one uh, thing I like to look at in fixed income is uh, is is spread. So looking at like the the 210 spread. Um, and and that's that's starting to flatten a bit, which just means that quite simply, yes, you've got baked in, uh, you've got baked in um, uh, Fed action, but future growth is not what 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 it seems like it's going to be. Naturally, that's equities are all about expectations, and so you seem to have this environment that could bring about a pretty nice correction, whether it's incredibly low volatility incredibly high equities, which of course, as we've seen, this has been a perfect case study since 2009, uh, that you know, high prices in and of themselves do not, do not create a bearish case. Uh, but when you have such, when you have such low volatility um, and, and you have a decreasing, at least per the bond market's view, which some would say are the smartest guys in the room, uh, some would say they're morons. <laughs> well, well it, cer it, it, uh, it certainly isn't the it certainly isn't the equity guys. Uh, that's that was always that was that was always one of the, you know, I, I on the one desk that I was that, that I traded on. The guy had some fixed income experience, and he was always you know he was referring to them as being the you know the, the smart money, and, and he always yeah. referred to he always referred to the S and P's as, as as Mongo. Uh, and 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 he, and he was you know he was just like they're the last ones to you know they're the last ones to to to, to react, and uh, there's we can go into a whole uh, philosophical reason as to why that is, but yeah, with going back to the VIX, I mean the VIX here, um, looking at the one month, and you know I'm not I'm not much of a moving average uh, I'm not much of a moving average guy, but looking at the the average the uh, the one month average in the VIX, you have to go back to the summer of 2014. Uh, to find the one month average of on, on the VIX and the price of the VIX, and we've been going through. Uh, I'm just going to take the screen real quick uh, because I just kind of want to show what what it is that I'm what it is that I'm looking at. So bear with me one second while I fumble around here. Um, is that is that we've got this? We've you know we've got it all the way down here, right? And and and, and volatility is 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 highly mean reverting. Right. And you go through low periods of volatility, go to high periods, and actually, it's easier to predict when we're going to have a lower period of volatility coming because volatility spikes, right? It's a fear barometer. But mm -hmm. when it stays low, it's a little harder to, to anticipate when it's actually going to, uh, to 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 pop. And and as we can see over here, we've got this you know this real this real long stretch here where volatility is extremely low, and and every time we've been low for you know two or three month periods. Uh, you, you get a spike, at least even just a little spike. So, you know, like you said, with with the way that equities are positioned right now, you know, it's kind of like we're in a little blow off stage, right? You know, especially when you look at, you know, you look at something like like the NDX. You know, the NDX is just is just going bananas. It is. Uh, you know, you know, it's up like whatever, like eight nine percent already this year, which is which is pretty nuts. Uh, so so you know, and 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 it's and it's just like it's just like the never ending bid. Uh, yeah. And you've got you've got the S and P's doing the same thing, and even the Dow, which is you know it's kind of a slug. Uh, the, the the Dow here, you know, it's up like whatever four percent this month or something like that. Uh, something crazy. I mean, four percent, and then it's it's you know not even it's a little past the middle of the month. So you know it kind of feels like we're in a little bit of a blow off stage. But these but these 
these periods can can you know maybe while it'll be over in a week, you know it could be the Dow could be 500 points higher before it ends. So it's kind of one of those things where you know yeah we're probably getting to a point where uh, you know you, you, you certainly wouldn't want to be chasing the market, uh, but do you want to take the other side of that? I you know I'm not me, not me personally. So mm -hmm. I agree. Then you get this low, very very low level in, in the VIX, and then you've got and then you've got this 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 parabolic like short-term price behavior going on and it kind of feels like a blow-off here you know and and we you know if you remember Dave we talked about that a couple of weeks ago that was kind of we, we with with Michael we were we were talking about how you know maybe maybe this that consolidation that we were seeing could turn into uh, could mm -hmm. turn into you know some kind of blow-off right mm -hmm. and that we could get uh, that we could get kind of parabolic so so with that said, I think that's where we're at right now, and uh, I think that, that fairly soon we're gonna we're gonna see some kind of top, and we are coming up on 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 March, which can be a a, a pivotal m uh, month, and and so I'm thinking that maybe we're gonna get a little spring volatility, which will be certainly welcomed on this end, and I think anybody I can speak for anybody who's trading, uh, because volatility has just been getting compressed in everything. You know, even looking at FX, you know, looking at implied volatilities, they just keep they just keep shrinking. Uh, and at some point, that shrinkage is going to become expandage. <laughs> that's that's a technical term, by the way. Uh, and and so yeah, I think that like basically right now we're kind of setting up. People get really depressed about low volatility and, and periods like that. But after a while, you got to get optimistic because that means we're about to have some some fun, right? So and that's, that's want... the way I look at it. And that's where Paul, Go you ahead. know. I... I think the, this key sort of theme that I would like to present today is I think they're there. You know, I think you just kind of kind of got to look um, maybe not too much at the, at the popular pairs. And that's why let me take back the screen here and we'll take some questions here as well. But, you know, that's why I like what's happening with the Aussie end, right? We broke the monthly opening range. Um, again, maybe tracking with what's happening with U.S. markets. But, you know, I like Aussie yen. And, and, and as we were talking about, Paul, I guess for weeks now, it's been where this, this rise in risk appetite. And, you know, those were the headlines that I was seeing, you know, this week on CNBC. Like, you know, is it exhausted? Has stocks, are stocks looking very stretched? But, you know, we continue to see these headlines. But, you know, everything continues to pan out. I think some of these themes, again, like this pickup in risk appetite is here to stay. And, you know, let me get to some of the questions here. And, um Al was asking from before, you know, we're seeing some of these themes about how gold keeps going up and also noting here, you know, how can we interpret some of the dollar weakness that we're seeing, even though we got some hawkish tone from the Fed, you know, some better than expected U.S. data releases. And, you know, I'll just take a quick second here uh, to cover some of the data. But uh, the one thing that I always, you know, like to share with everyone is, is, the, is the Fed countdown, right? Um, I'll just refresh this page for us. But as you mentioned, Al, you know, I think March is the next big date. And it really comes on the, on the cusp of this theme that, we tend to look for the Fed to move at these quarterly rate decisions, right? So I think that's market consensus right now. So rule out every other meeting. Just look at these quarterly meetings like the you know, one in March, one in June, you know, the next one in December as you know, the potential ones that we could get the rate increases, right? Uh, and that's where you, you, you personally see you know, what's happening here for March right now. Even though, again, we got the rhetoric from Fed um, Chair Janet Yellen this week, markets, again, pricing 82% chance that they will not move. Uh, next month and perhaps in June again we're seeing that as a greater chance right still holding above 60 it's been going back and forth between 60 70 percent right that they will raise in June right that's how to read the table right 30 percent that they'll hold in June right 70 percent that they'll raise so yeah so again has the data has the rhetoric this week really shifted interest rate expectations not so much and that's why you know I think it really brings us to back to you know what Tyler's talking about and watching you know what's happening with the US yield and you know some of the differentials there and and I'll bring back to some of the comments that we got and my personal takeaway from Chair Yellen this week and this is the one headline that I'll just point out the only headline that I will is this right she noted here during the testimony inflation moved up over the past year mainly because of the diminishing effects of earlier declines in energy prices and import prices. Let me bring up one more headline, and this is not from Chair Yellen, this is from the ECB's meeting minutes, and um, where is it? I gotta search for it, I lost my place. Ah, so let me do a quick search. ECB largely shared the same rhetoric, saying that again, it's really the, the Headline inflation has increased recently, mainly, mainly owing to developments in energy prices, right? So what does this tell me? Uh, maybe that will be the next argument, uh, Fed, maybe ECB officials, 
right? Uh, maybe that will be the next argument for them to continue on with their current course, right? Maybe the Fed will delay the normalization cycle a little bit more. Maybe the ECB will extend right, the quantitative easing program because they're blaming, again, the recent pickup in inflation on higher energy costs, right? Um, so has the picture changed? So again, this is my personal interpretation of the data, Al. And again, these are just the statements that we got from the ECB and Fed. But again, this is a global theme that I think we may see a lot of central bank officials uh, reiterate and just to reinforce their view, right? You look at the CPI print that we got. Here's the December read. Just quickly, if you look at all the big advances, it was all on energy, right? So, in fact, you know, what the Fed is talking about, what the ECB is talking about is, in fact, true that, you know, we're seeing this reflation in CPI largely driven, right, by energy price. So, what does this tell me? Maybe we'll have to watch these core rate of inflations a little bit more closely going forward. And, you know, for now, I don't think the needle has changed. So, you know, and, and let, let's bring it back to, you know, some of the trade setups this week. I think I covered some of mine here, like Aussie Yen. I do like this one. I'm watching this near-term formation right now. We'll see if we could get back into you know, some better um, levels that I like watching right now. So we're coming up against a former re short-term resistance zone, but uh, right now I'll watch that 50-day moving average person just because it's lining up with that trend line that I have carried over from pretty, pretty much the beginning of the year. So again, I do think that we're just getting these pullbacks and risk appetite. So you know, we'll see if some of these dynamics will continue to pan out next week. Uh, we just have a lot of second-tier data next week, nothing meaningful. And especially as we're going through the last full week of February, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we do see maybe a further consolidation of some of the current ranges. Um, but for some of the majors right now, Chris, I know you were asking about dollar CAD before, but you know, even with dollar CAD, uh, what can I say? It's very stubborn right now, right? I, I do like it. I'm pretty constructive long term, and I'm sure if Mr. Butchus was here, he would love talking about uh, the the slope of these trend lines and how they continue to you know, be a nice factor here of watching some of the top side risk. But uh, we're consolidating right now. I think this might continue into next week. So we'll see if you know, we get any meaningful headlines. We have that G20 meeting going on. So um, that's my sort of take here. But um, Tyler, Paul, uh, what's your sort of trade stance? Any sort of themes, trade setups, if you will, that you're, you're focused on for the, for the uh, final full week of February? I would encourage you guys to continue to keep an eye on, you know, you talked about dollar CAD, Kiwi dollar, Aussie dollar. Um, you know, we ha we just we seem to have this interesting environment where, again, it seems like a lot of what the Fed has done uh, or is planning to do is is baked in, and that's you know that was kind of the are you not entertained comment from earlier is because we're not getting further dollar appreciation on on positive news. Do you mind if I uh, take the screen over real quick? Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to pass it to you. Right. Go now. for it. All right. Thanks, man. All right, so this is a this is a pretty cool chart. Uh, it was on the terminal earlier today, and it was just, it was showing basically how far away um, or on what side of inflation targets that that naturally three of the largest uh, central banks are. Uh, doesn't have BOJ on here, but the uh, that kind of teal line is uh, BOE, the white line is the Fed um, or U.S. inflation, and the yellow line is um, is European inflation. Uh, obviously, you can see that we are we are beyond. The, uh, we are beyond the inflation target, which we talked a little bit about earlier. Uh, again, to me, that's why that uh, that 210 spread is so important, is because if it's starting to push down, it's meaning that you know for, further growth is at least in, is in the U.S. not not as baked in. But if we're getting near-term inflation, uh, which is what this trend to the right of the chart, hopefully you can see we're, we're seeing the slope up. That would seem to that would seem to benefit commodities. So for me, you know, while we're talking about the slope and dollar CAD, and you know, I cover dollar CAD from a technical analysis point of view for daily FX. Uh, I would I would be just like I am on on uh, on on dollar yen. I would be watching as to whether or not we possibly get a breakdown. Um, we are at 130 seems to be a, a, a brick wall uh, that the dollar cad does not want to break down. Uh, but as we've seen through some of the proxies, if you will, for for commodities or risk taking in the EMFX world, so David was talking about Czar and 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 uh, a little bit earlier, those breakdowns have come eventually, and and we have seen magnificent reversals of even more magnificent long-term bullish trends. Um, so you know you look at uh, dollar Czar. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that's going to be in the market technician's books uh, for ages about the power of a trend here, uh, and, and now we're turning back lower. Dollar CAD, oops, dollar CAD does not look a whole lot different. Uh, it, it's a bit more choppy because of its in energy correlation, whereas Zara has got a bit more of a, of a Chinese component to it. But all that being said, if we get a breakdown here from an Elliott wave perspective, that just looks like a clean start of a C wave. So that move from January 16 to May 16 was basically an A wave. 
really nasty choppy B wave, which is a classic B wave in Elliott wave terms, which is a you know a, a disruption and a correction, and then a continuation of that move. Uh, and you can see this is kind of a, a, a you know more recent slope that I have uh, drawn here, uh, and, and we're basically respecting it well. Paul was asking about Ichimoku earlier. You can see prices below the cloud. Momentum is below or the momentum line is below price from. 26 periods ago, so if we get a breakdown, and that's a big if, if we get a breakdown, it would seem to follow that the market's just not going to bid up the dollar further despite the economic data that we're getting. And economic data is good right now. If you look at the City Economic Surprise Index, we've been basically bottom left to top right since October in U.S. economic data. Again, it kind of goes to what we're talking about with the VIX. It seems like you have an environment where the risks are asymmetric for the dollar. It sets up where there's more downside risk than upside risk because good news isn't bringing in the buyers, but bad news could definitely bring in the sellers because we've seen Yellen over her career really respect market unease and, and kind of backing off. I'm going to go to dollar yen real quick and then uh, I'll, I'll bring in Paul. Uh, but similar here, so this is this is um, this is pretty interesting in my view on uh, on dollar yen. It's a four-hour chart for our Ichimoku cloud. Uh, this, is a, this is a critical point. We're sitting basically at the 618 of this, of this move higher. So we had this pretty sharp correction here. We're sitting at 61.8% of the February range. Uh, if we bounce here and go higher, then disregard everything I've said. <laughs> dollar yen's probably moving higher. Probably got this nice dollar bull market continuing on, uh, and, 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 and dollar yen is a way to look at it. But if we continue to break down here, it could be, it could be a rough, finish for February and potentially a rough March uh, for, for those dollar bulls. So, you know, to me, you take a look at the intermarket view, you take a look at some of the technical patterns, uh, and, and potentially, yes, we have low volatility in every market you look at. Again, you've got triangulations and yields. Uh, crude oil actually just, I think, hit uh, its, its, its basically dullest week in terms of price change in 13 years. Um, so, so all that being said, you have a, a just kind of the stagnant market right now. But as you know, Paul and I like to talk about, this definitely gives you an opportunity to to wait to pounce on that breakout. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to move on. I'll, I'll move over and uh, I'll talk a little bit about now. I guess what I'm looking at. Uh, I'm just going to take over the screen here. All right. I don't know what happened. I don't know what what screen do you guys are are you able to see right now? No, you're good. I'm showing your silver. No, yep. oh, you're showing the silver. Okay, okay. So silver is something that that I've been I've been tracking for a little while now. Um, yeah, you call that head <coughs> and shoulders. Me. The inverse head and shoulders a while back. Yeah, 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 yeah. This has been something that's been playing out. You know, we got the we got the official neckline break. Uh, back on the end of last month, but then we had to clear this trend line going back to July, which we have. And right now, I'm going to change this. this was, I just had this in here for the purposes of the VIX. But we, we got above the 200 die, uh, which, were, which I viewed as being a minor challenge. I think that, that right now, uh, we've, got, we've got a nice little channel here forming. So even from a short-term perspective, this is a, a broader pattern that, that, that points to a move towards 19. Uh, which happens to also be the November high, but I think in the short term, I think that that being you know a dip buyer in silver is something that uh, is something that I like as long as it maintains this this nice steady up move. I could see at some point this thing you know silver is one of those it's very spiky, uh, so I could even see silver at one point, especially if the dollar really gets weak. Yeah, I mean, if uh, although I had to really. Uh, Copper's been a yeah, little bit spiky, but I like the move there too. I think uh, I have to sort of share the sentiment. I'm I'm bullish silver, but even with copper, you know, I, I do like it higher. We just saw some fresh 2017 highs over the last few days, mm -hmm. and you know, I think we have to be supportive of you know some of these commodity moves. And um, even with gold, I know you've been watching gold too, but we're right at the highs right now. And that's the one thing I was noting this week is that you know we we saw silver press fresh monthly highs this week. Was gold going to follow? And I think we are starting to see some of these themes largely pan out. But uh, no, I share mm -hmm. I share your sentiment, Paul. But you know, just want to pick your pick your brain about copper because I know I always like to talk to you about Dr. Copper here. Uh, I I do like it. I'm I'm constructive, bigger picture. I think just like what you have there, we, we're just in this triangle. But I think we got a nice break right of the top side. So I think maybe we get we, we, we back. did we did. My my only concern is is that it, I mean it needs it needs to hold here because we, we you know we do have this wedge. Oh, yeah. and, <clears throat> excuse me. And if we don't hold this bottom trend line, whenever whenever yeah. you get a pattern that breaks and then it fails, 
uh, you can you can get a pretty momentous move back in the opposite direction. So so to me right now, you know, as long as it as long as it can maintain that trend line, then I think that I think that you got to be constructive on it. And from a from a line in the stand uh, line in the sand sand I can't talk a line in the sand standpoint. That's what I was trying to say. Uh, is that you know if if you like it long this is this is getting to that spot where it's like okay it, it needs to start to turn back up and if it does from a risk reward standpoint it's not a bad looking proposition uh, the, the you know and you still have you still have higher highs higher lows and holding this trend line would just be another higher low right so I am uh, I am constructive on on, on copper and, and and even you know I, I like silver the best just because it's got the cleanest picture but even looking at gold you know gold is is one that it's facing resistance again but you know overall I mean you, you, you got to respect this trend here and and, uh, and and if and if we do see that topping formation in the dollar come to fruition, and and I don't like to get overly caught up in the correlation between the two, because for example, the two-week correlation between silver and the dollar recently was as high as 78% on the positive side. So sometimes you know it could be a little in the shorter term, especially uh, the correlations can be a little deceiving, uh, and 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 and. So you kind of got to take it with the, you know, it, I, I like to look at the market in a bubble more so, uh, and then have that kind of off in the in, in the background because we've seen gold go up 10% before and the dollar also rally. That happened in like 2014. So, so you know, it, but I don't. It certainly won't hurt uh, to see to see the dollar uh, sell off. Now, getting away, I guess, from the from the commodity block and everything, and and back to the FX space from a shorter term standpoint. Uh, we were talking about this one earlier, and I mentioned that uh, we've got we've got Sterling Oz uh, coming down at a pretty interesting point here. Um, this is something that that would be a you know a next week type of thing, given the proximity uh, of of this this descending wedge and then this trend trend line. So we got this trend line going back here to October, coming underneath these lows. We've got this descending wedge, which is kind of like a you can kind of look at it as a powder keg. Uh, I've, I, I, you know, as I said earlier, I'm, you know, it, Tyler asked me which way do you think it's going to go, and I said up or down. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and yes, I will be that guy who says that because this pattern mm -hmm. just simply means that we're about to get an expansion in volatility. And with that said, we have this trend line. Uh, a lot of times, you know, you get these descending wedges into support. They end up, they end up bouncing back to the, they, they end up, you know, turning around because you, know, you think about it. And I was explaining it this morning in, in this morning's webinar is that you have this this descending wedge. Basically, you have these lower highs and lower lows. So, so if you're if you're a short, you're getting confident. You're getting more and more confident, right? Because the trade is essentially working. And when it stops working and it starts to move against you, you're going to have you're going to have those same the same market participants that have been selling uh, are going to be running for cover. So it can lead to an explosive move in the opposite direction. Uh, but with that said, if we break this trend line, this could also lead to a sharp move lower. So really, it's a whichever way it breaks uh, type of situation for me. But I do think that next week we're going to see a pretty good move out of this particular cross, and so it's one that's that's high on my radar. Yeah, I mean, and 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 to see a sterling cross like that tighten ahead of March, I'm not really surprised by that. You know, we're we're expecting some big headlines yeah. and some clarity on, you know, what's going to happen with this whole Brexit. And to be honest. My parents were asking me about Brexit earlier this week about, you know, is that still in play? Like, are they still leaving? So, you know, I, I think it's definitely going to come back. You know, it was sort of off the radar for a little bit, but, you know, certainly a big theme coming up. So I think, you know, cable crosses, I mean, you're much braver than I am, Paul. I, it looks as though, again, maybe that explosion in volatility could really come from the Sterling's end uh, with the whole UK referendum. But, you know, for now, my Can game plan is I'm just, I just don't like touching Sterling. Uh, I like Aussie yen, you know, I like some of the yen crosses. Um, but, you know, that's my big game plan as I think, you know, the broader theme right now is, you know, the pickup and risk. You know, I, I think we cannot ignore that and, you know, we'll see what's going to happen with these benchmark equity ind uh, indices next week. But um, any last comments from uh, Paul, Tyler? I would like to make a comment on the on the pound Aussie, um, and and it's you're absolutely right. We've got you know what's 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 anticipated to be the release of Article 50, uh, or that trigger. But uh, Aussie, I think, is still worth keeping an eye on. There was a there was to me uh, a fascinating news story that that, that came out this week, uh, and it's basically that uh, Anglo American, uh, you know, one of the largest miners, has halted asset sales, uh, which you know an asset sale is something that a company will try and do to bring in cash and to to, to take things off their books. Because because these mines have become a cash cow. 
Um, and, and, and that's that's significant. When when a company makes that massive decision of saying, okay, let's sell off this asset to saying, you know what, this thing is generating massive profits, let's hold on to it. Um, that to me is a, is a is a boon for the commodity view. Um, you know, so so again, kind of starting back over in the in the um, intermarket analysis and looking at different different market cycles, you typically look at market cycles starting with bonds, so a rally in bonds, we definitely you know saw that over the last handful of years, then stocks, that continues on, and then followed by commodities. And it, and it seems like we could still see that big move in commodities. Uh, anybody that's read my uh, oil pieces, um, you know, knows that, you know, while we've been we've been basically sideways since January 3rd, the environment still seems to be bullish. But if you look at stories like this, um, and like David was talking about with copper, and if you look at iron ore and the story that's going on there, it, it seems to show that there is basically what could be the potential for hurricane force winds behind the back of commodities and commodity currencies. So, you know, I, I absolutely agree with Paul's view that, you know, pound Aussie could go up or down, but it seems like there's a lot of background that could take this lower and take it lower in a hurry. Yeah, sure. And if you get that break there, I mean, that's I'm, I'm all on board on that mm -hmm. one then. Mm -hmm. And actually, Tyler, let's take this last question as, you know, you're, you're talking, what do you think about, you know, we've been largely capped. Um, I mean, 55 was like that big high print that we made. Uh, for now, I think 54 handle, we still are struggling to get a single closing price above that region. So, you know, 54, 55, that's my big region. And we've been sort of holding a very tight range here. But what's your sort of take on, on oil? So here, here's my here's my chart on oil. And, you know, oil oil to me has been has been a classic Elliott Wave triangle pattern because if you, if you for those of you that are comfortable with Elliott Wave, basically, you know, it's, it's a it's a it's a cycling in of enthusiasm and hate and boredom, you know, that, that happens in markets. And so typically what happens is anytime you get this, what I like to call a time correction as opposed to a price correction, which is definitely what you'd see here in oil, and I've got a, a triangle kind of highlighted on here, it basically sucks out the enthusiasm that came with the prior bullish move. That doesn't mean, though, that the bullish structure is harmed in any such way. And in fact, if you apply Ichimoku and you know some Elliott Wave analysis, throw on some Andrew's pitchfork in there to, to complete the witch's brew, um, it seems <laughs> like we have this environment that, that, again, I think sets up, yes, we're in a dull moment right now, but could bring a spark higher, which, you know, if, if you're looking for that, if you're looking for the spark to the fuel, it could be dollar weakness, it, it could be a resumption of commodities with all these different stories that are kind of working in the background, uh, but but either way you look at it, yes, we've been dull, yes, it's been sideways, um, but, you know, I'd, I'd have to put the odds slightly in favor of a pretty nice bullish breakout that I think could take us to the upper 50s or lower 60s. I don't, you know, if you, if you look at historical developments when OPEC has cut, uh, I mean, we've seen we've seen extreme rallies. Um, we've seen extreme rallies, and last Friday we saw, you know, it's been roughly a 92% compliance rate of OPEC. And yeah, there's been some U.S. supply that's come onto the market, but net net, I think you look at the broader commodity picture. You look at what we've been talking about with the dollar and its historical negative correlation of the commodity world. Uh, you know, I'm I'm, I'm sitting here, um, you know, personally with some with some bullish energy exposure because I think we're about to see a nice move higher, David. Yeah, very nice chart, sure and, and and I'm sort of with you on that. You know, with this push by OPEC, and more so the way I'm looking at oil prices, if it continues higher, and you know, as you project, Tyler, uh, if we're able to get closer to 60 bucks, how will this pan out for the Fed? Right? W will they have to take a more stern stance, if mm -hmm. you will, and and something similar that we heard during the easing cycle, right, where they're saying, oh well, you know, we're seeing inflation dragged down by weaker energy price, so we need to look through that, and again, will this really cloud the outlook for monetary policy going forward? So, you know, a lot of themes going on right now, um, but with that, uh, I think we went a little bit over on time, uh, but nevertheless, I hope you guys enjoyed My the fault. overview, <laughs> and always appreciate, you know, your, your guys' comments on things, um, and for now, I think, you know, there's going to be a lot to watch, especially going into March with um, you know, as you guys mentioned, like Pound Aussie looks on the cusp of a bigger move. I think oil's trying to do something similar. We'll see if gold you know, can follow along with silver, trying to press to uh, fresh monthly highs, if you will. I know we have you know one last full week of February left. Uh, but with that, if um, no other comments from you guys? No, I think I'm good. I think, I, I think I'll hold my silence. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, it's not uncommon. I mean, it, it's, it's uncommon for me to do such, but I will hold my silence. 
All right, with that, guys, hope everyone enjoyed the overview. And again, we just have one last full week. So, of course, another theme I think we'll be, need to be mindful of is, of course, maybe month end flows, things of that nature. Uh, but with that, um, I believe we'll be back in two weeks to do another roundtable. Um, and again, we all have um, chock full of webinars scheduled for next week. Again, there's a lot of second tier data on tap for the week ahead. Um, but feel free to check out the well, uh, webinar calendars. Um, and with that, Best of luck on everyone's trades. Have a great weekend, everyone. And um, Monday is a U.S. holiday, guys, so markets are closed. So we may face some thin market conditions, not only, again, going into the weekend, but even earlier next week. So on Tuesday, when market participation returns, maybe that's when we'll get a little bit more interesting price action. Uh, but with that, have a great day, guys. Thanks for having me. All right. <laughs> it's been Bye, real, guys. guys. It's been real. Thanks, everybody, for your questions.